All right, galaxies have grown, and uh, we'll see some movies that will show you how they grow. They grow by their gravitational attraction to each other. Um, uh, what happens when two galaxies collide? Now, when we collide with Andromeda, it's it will turn out that not a single, probably not a single star will collide with another star because the space between the stars is so large. Remember, the nearest star to us is measured like, uh, you know, it's uh, several hundred thousand times the size of, of our astronomical unit. Uh, that means that they'll just pass through each other and they'll never hit anything. So these are called collisionless uh, they're collisionless because nothing happens to them. This is collisionless dark matter, or collisionless uh, objects. Okay, uh, and quasars are, were more abundant in the past than in present. Quasars are these active galactic nuclei. Uh, why were they so, so bright in the past and now they're general, generally pretty cool? Uh, quasars are the giant black holes at the center of galaxies. Uh, what happens to them? Uh, what happens? Well, we'll talk about that. Now, uh, let me show you. This is uh, visual. This is done by uh, Frank Summers. He made this movie. Uh, let's see. Okay. Now, this is a simulation of two galaxies that are attracting to each other. Uh, blue is the outer portions. Uh, the galaxies first attract, uh, then they collide. And they don't, they don't actually hit each other. But they collide and pull out streamers. The streamers come back. And they merge to form a bigger streamer. I mean, uh, a central region has grown bigger. And if it had black holes, they've merged, they will merge to form one black hole. Okay. Um, next, here's another simulation. This simulation is primarily gas. Uh, in the gas is, uh, they also show an active galactic nuclei here that's going to blow up when it starts fe getting fed by gas. It falls down into the center of it, of the object, and then it starts, it gets really angry. It starts spewing out all types of, uh, of material. Uh, here it's going to start now. This, here's, here it goes. The, blue, the red objects are hot gas that it's expelling. The hot gas starts to expel the dust and gas. That's what this is. It makes a holy mess. Sweeps the galaxy of all gas and dust. And blam, blows out all the gas and dust. This can probably, this is probably the mechanism that, whoa, ferocious. This is two black holes getting close together and they, uh, Pretty neat. Okay, this has blown out all the gas in the galaxy, which has extended out a long way. And if there's no gas in the galaxy, then you form those, you don't form stars. If you don't form stars, the object becomes red. And we think that is uh, what happens to elliptical galaxies, which are red. This was done by Volker Springle uh, and Lars Hernquist. Volker Springle is a uh, uh, scientist at uh, Max Planck Institute for Astrophysic uh, in Germany. Uh, Lars Hernquist is a professor at, uh, at Harvard. Okay, now look at this. This, is, this shows the formation of a galaxy. Here it is, 0 0.95095 years. So the galaxy is going to form uh, at uh, it's going to form well in the past. Remember, the age of our universe is 13 billion years. So the, it'll be counting along here. Uh, the galaxy will form, and it's going to form, the whole coordinate system is, uh, in all these simulations, the coordinate system is, uh, is done in what is called co-moving coordinates. We 
we've already seen that a little bit. <coughs> All right, in co-moving coordinates, you have uh, an object. Here it starts off. And then later it grows big. All right, this is, this is thought of as the uh, size of the universe. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to plot, everything's going to be in this fixed units here. So the expansion of the universe is not shown. It'll plot everything in this coordinate system. And the coordinate system are simply expanded. But it's uh, the same coordinate system. This is co-moving to go from here to here. Co-moving in a sense that here's a galaxy, here's another galaxy, and uh, the galaxies, um, do I have the same? Yeah. The galaxies are here and here. So in this unit, in this unit uh, these galaxies are closer together than those galaxies. But the whole system is, everybody in the simulation, uh, there's, there's knowledge of the, of the expansion, but they don't show the expansion. So that makes it easier to see this. All right, let me, uh, let's turn this on. Okay, what happens is the little overdensity grows. The overdensity will become part of a galaxy. It's growing, and here comes another one, a collision. The, the filament st uh, structure is, uh, you see this is getting denser. Uh, the, here's two billion years. This is a little galaxy, it's going to have other collisions. Here's come some more. Uh, and all these galaxies are flowing together. All this in co-moving coordinates, and the galaxies uh, are swirling to make a, ga a real galaxy like our own. Here is an object that's swirling around, just like our galaxy. Very content, all attracting other stuff, all lots of little stuff around is falling in. And here, bang, that's a sizable collision. Uh, the collision at first, uh, they don't really stop. Uh, they do a dance. Here, see, they do uh, pas du, pas de du, and uh, then they make a galaxy. Okay, and the galaxy uh, later is simply sitting there and attracting the matter around it. That is how our galaxy formed. Our galaxy had a very, very violent youth. Lots and lots of collisions. Uh, here we're only up to nine billion years. Uh, these are, what's plotted is uh, fluffy uh, particles, that's actually the gas around uh, the galaxies, or pieces of galaxies. Uh, we're not showing the dark matter. Uh, is that neat? It's pretty neat. Okay, now, uh, let's, all right, here's another one. This is, uh, let's see if I can figure out how this one works. Okay, this is a, a universe expanding. It's attracting material. It's really violent. Uh, now this is, we see this at a, this is at a redshift of order 10. And the universe was really different. Uh, the galaxies were in small pieces. Uh, now this one shows, uh, these bubbles are the uh, expansion of supernova remnants. Uh, when the supernova remnant occurs, it blows the gas away because the supernova has so much power uh, and it blows it away. Then the gas forms again, a big, a big merger occurs. Every, there's a merger, or there's a supernova, here's more. Uh, more supernova blows it up and eventually it gets so large it does have supernova in the center that form the black uh, circles for a moment. Another one. Uh, 
Another one. This again is the gas. Uh, another one. And eventually it settles down to a merger and you formed uh, the galaxy. Now those supernova remnants as they blew up are what is polluting the galaxy with heavy, heavy metals. And the heavy material, anything higher than helium, more or less gets made in supernovae. And that is uh, necessary, of course, for our existence. We wouldn't be here without it. Uh, we are, after all, stardust. And uh, we're the results of violent explosions in the past. Astounding. Okay. Now, if you look at the galaxy distribution on larger scales, we're now past the galaxy scale. We're going to observe the universe on bigger scales. Uh, this was a very surprising episode. Now here, what we're plotting is uh, the observer is sitting right here, and we're looking out. Uh, plotted here is the redshift in a simple way. Uh, redshift is uh, v is equal to h naught times d. All right, these are distances, and uh, plotted are the each point is a galaxy. Now the question is, why the hell are the galaxies distributed in this way? Now what this says, if you look at it closely, this is the Harvard Stickman. I did this is my work. Uh, I did this work uh, when I was at Harvard. Uh, here's a stick man, here's his head, here's his feet, here's his arm. He's a skier, actually. Here's the long ski poles, see? Uh, and he's flailing around about to fall. Uh, now, this, is, uh, this data was collected uh, basically 30 years ago when I was uh, at Harvard, and uh, it, uh, it was crazy. We didn't expect anything like this. We thought the galaxies are distributed. Uh, they don't know anything. Uh, so this was a very big surprise. Why, why, is it, why are the galaxy distribution so non-random? This is not a random distribution at all. Uh, very big, there are voids. There are uh, large filamentary structures called great walls. Uh, and boys all over the place. Uh, why does it do this? All right, so why, of all, these, of all of this data, drove me to come to Berkeley? I didn't, uh, I didn't see how I could understand this. I didn't feel like taking more data. I came to Berkeley to do n-body simulations, and I'll show you some of them. Now, in the uh, 30 years, People have uh, done amazing studies. This was, uh, this was done on a 60-inch telescope. Uh, we built the instrumentation for it, really crummy instrumentation compared to today. This survey is uh, huge. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is out to 10,000 kilometers a second, and what is that, a billion light years? It's only right, right in the, the foreground. This is a survey in the sky uh, known for, is done on a big four meter telescope uh, and they, uh, they were able to do about uh, 50 or 100 galaxies at once. And uh, I had to do my survey one at a time. Point, point, point. It took a while to do that. It was pretty laborious. Um, okay, now, uh, now on scales of 10 to the eighth years, 10 to the 8th light years, the galaxies are distributed in chains and sheets surrounding these giant voids. 10 to the 8th light years. Uh, but uh, they're clumped together. Galaxies are, are rarely isolated. Normally they're in groups, clusters, superclusters. These names don't mean very much. Uh, just that uh, the galaxies are grouped together. Uh, and the uh, distribution is incredibly non-random. Uh, and large filamentary shapes. All right, uh, and this is a hierarchy of structure. What does it tell us? How do we know what it means? Okay, and, but if you go to bigger scales of say 10 to the ninth years, 
uh, which is this, this much, uh, bigger than this, uh, the galaxies are evenly distributed. The filaments and voids are pretty even. The galaxies are the same everywhere. And that was the conjecture necessary to, uh, to make the models that uh, Einstein uh, first talked about. He talked about a homogeneous universe. And this is hardly homogeneous, but uh, if you average on long scale, if you have really lousy vision, and you see only on big scales, uh, then it's pretty homogeneous. And so that is OK. All right. Now, uh, this is a simulation. This is a more recent simulation of structure formation in the universe. It looks exactly like the data. The data uh, shows filaments, voids, exactly the same. How does this stimulation work? Now the simulation is, co is embedded, is doing simulation with dark matter. Dark matter of a type known as cold dark matter. And this thing is incredibly like the data. Why does it look so similar? Now I came to Berkeley to do this, these sort of simulations. Uh, we didn't have the computing power uh, necessary. We had a, a VAX 11780. Anybody know it? Everybody ever heard of that machine? VAX 11780. I mean, it's older than you. And it was about as powerful, less powerful than a, uh, uh, one of the original laptops. Uh, 8086 processor in those? Was that the name? Anybody computer not savvy know that what they're called? Uh, really fairly primitive processor in the first laptops. Uh, but uh, in the, you know, it was 30 years or 20 years for the field to change, I mean, for the NBOT, for the computer industry to change enormously. And we, we always use the latest computers to do the type of work. And what we had at the beginning was totally a joke. But it was fun. Uh, we couldn't quite do anything this pretty. All right, now, uh, now let's uh, look at this model. Uh, OK, oops. Uh, what happened? Hey, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, OK. All right, here is uh, formation of a galaxy. This is, again, in co-moving coordinates. Uh, the galaxy, uh, actually, this is not co-moving coordinates. This is physical coordinates. And the galaxy forms. Didn't I show you this? Yeah, I don't, show, don't want to see this. OK, well, let's skip this. Uh, Here's another simulation, this one by Ben Moore, who was a postdoc here. Here is the size of the universe. Oops. OK, the size of the universe uh, starts off at uh, 0.09. That is uh, about uh, redshift, about 11 or so. OK, so uh, if we play this one. This is now in physical coordinates. Uh, that there, up there is the redshift. The structures are forming. They're all forming because of the dent, the little fluctuations that were in the original universe. They form. They form. See all the clouds around it. OK, and that is, that is supposed to be a picture of uh, maybe uh, us and Andromeda. This might be what we look like. Uh, here's us, or here's us, and here's Andromeda, with lots of junk between us. Uh, that might be what it is. OK, now how do you measure the mass? Uh, we want to know what the mass of the cluster will be. I mean, we see this on, in the sky, so how do we know how heavy it is? 
in a cluster of galaxies, the orbits don't happen in a time scale you can look at. They, uh, they may be buzzing around like bees, but if you take a snapshot, it's it. You don't get to see it again. But what you can do is uh, uh, nothing moving. In spite of this, you can still estimate it because uh, you know, use the same trusty equation for uh, circular velocity. V squared equals gm over r. This equation we've seen again and again. Uh, so what do you put in? Uh, you measure r and you measure v squared. And how do we do that? Uh, here, for example, we want to measure the mass of this cluster. It has two bright galaxies here and here. And all these little things, little red things, are galaxies that belong to it. Uh, all right. Uh, this is the coma cluster, uh, and he, uh, Fritz Zwicky was the first to discuss it uh, 50 years ago. Uh, and now this thing has a size on the sky of about one degree. The recession velocity you can measure from the spectral shift of this is 6,900 kilometers a second. All right, so you put it together. Hubble's law, uh, H naught d, uh, theta, uh, the velocity is 6,900 kilometers a second, and this tells us the distance, I'm sorry, uh, the size of this thing is h not equals 70, and uh, the diameter of this whole cluster is 100 megaparsecs. All right, that's just from applying Hubble's law. Uh, and by a small angle approximation, uh, using a small angle for the object, uh, the distance, the uh, theta uh, times the distance is the transfer size. And uh, that means that r is 2 megaparsecs. So the size of this to here is 2 megaparsec. That tells you uh, basically how big the cluster is. OK, this is Fritz Wicke. He was a fairly ferocious character. Uh, this, these are some books that he wrote. Uh, it's somewhat crazy, but uh, there's Fritz, good old Fritz. Uh, you get some really ornery uh, people who go into astronomy. He was uh, definitely a character. OK, so you measure the mass. Now, what you can do is you look at the velocities. You, there, there's about 1,000 galaxies in the cluster. And you see the velocities are moving relative to each other at about 1,000 kilometers a second. And so you say that's the velocity of the cluster. OK, 1,000 kilometers a second, that's pretty, pretty serious. Remember that our velocity around our galaxy is 200 kilometers a second. This is very high velocity. Uh, all right. And uh, uh, then you solve for the mass. V squared R over G, and that turns out to be 410 to the 14th times the mass of the sun. Is what does that number mean? Now you can add up the light of the galaxies, and you find that uh, you find a number that's 50 times. This is 50 times more than you get by adding the starlight from the cluster and assuming a certain mass per star. So the the power of this tells you right away that this galaxy cluster is not dominated by ordinary matter. It is dominated by something we call dark matter. Uh, the coma cluster is dominated by dark matter. All right? This is one example. If you study other clusters, you see exactly the same thing. Oh, and the question is, what is this mysterious dark matter? What in the world can it be? We want to understand it. All right, and here's various ways you can understand it. If you have a cluster back here, and you're trying to, in it, you're trying to take an image, here you look at it, and a real galaxy has, because it's a curved space, you know, the light is bent on a curved space, the light will come this way, it's bent, come this way, it's bent, here it is. Here is the same object. This is the same object bent, uh, you see it in two views there, you see it in more views here. That is one galaxy. 
that you see in multiple times. This tells us, now, the bending of this thing depends on the mass. It doesn't depend on anything else. You know, that's, that's what determines the bending. Of the, that determines the depth of the potential well, the mass of the object. If the mass is, is a baryonic, ordinary material like our galaxy, you get an answer. But if you put it in a lot of dark matter, the dark matter may not have light, but it has mass. And this is a way to measure the mass of the dark matter. A lot of mass in that. Okay, look at this one. This is so incredible. This is taken with the Hubble. Here, look at this arc. These arcs all over the place. Here's an arc to there. This is measuring the mass of these two. Uh, here's arcs. This is incredible. This was a great surprise when these were first seen in the 60s, no, late 60s, late 70s, when the pictures got good enough to see this. This is totally amazing. But with this, known as strong lensing, you're able to measure the mass of that galaxy cluster. And it's pretty damn neat. Here's another case. This case is, has blown away the entire community. Now, you saw some of those uh, simulations where the, uh, the, galaxies, uh, the galaxies went right through each other and uh, then turned around. Now, if they go through each other, what's going to happen? This in the blue is a measure of the dark matter as measured by the lensing of the material behind it. So this guy has dark matter here and dark matter here. The red image is what you see when you look at the galaxy in x-rays. Now, the x-rays are made by ordinary material, baryonic gas. The x-rays are formed when uh, the gas collides or gets bent by another particle. It's moving fast and it emits an x-ray. This emission, what has happened is these two collision, these two dark matter dominated objects have collided. But the gas in them gets stripped out by the collision. The gas cannot go through, its, through each other. If you take a gas cloud and hit it to another gas cloud, it'll collide. It's not like stars. The gas is, is microscopic, it collides. And the gas cannot go through the other thing, and it just it's left behind. This one's like a bullet. That means it, it's formed a supersonic uh, jet. It's a blast wave going through it. So here is an object. This is amazing. This object. Is a, is a cluster that is forming and has been through each other, been through once, and in that passage, the gas is stripped out of it. Now, what it says is the following. First of all, the dark matter did not suffer these collisions. The dark matter is therefore collisionless. All right, the dark matter is not like ordinary matter. Ordinary matter would have suffered collisions at that point, but dark matter does not. Why? Why doesn't it? And the answer is it's known as a weakly, we think it's a weakly interacting material. And I'll talk about what that means in a moment. All right, so uh, the dark matter has uh, really, uh, in this case, collided and made a beautiful uh, demonstration that the dark matter is collisionless. An amazingly, an amazing photograph. Now, here I'm going to next show you a gravitational lens. Uh, a gravitational lens is, is a poor quality lens, but it is a lens. This is formed, you can form a gravitational lens by taking a wine glass and cutting it off and throwing away the top. Just keep the bottom stem of the wine glass that flares out to be the, the, uh, the glass, the support of the glass, and pass it over. Now, in this case, the gravitational lens is uh, made up and uh, runs across this way. I'll show you what it does. It's sort of neat. Okay, 
So this guy, I don't know, it's, this is, San, I think, Seattle. Uh, the gravitational lens is coming in, and this material is getting, whoa, it's getting bent by the wine glass or gravitational lens. You see, each, everything is bent. It's bent around it. So if you ever see, if you ever see Seattle or some city looking like that, at least you know what it is, OK? Gravitational lens passing in front of it. Uh, that, and that's how it works. That's a, a simulation of the gravitational lensing process. In the reality, in order to bend it hard, to really bend the light, you have to have a lot of mass. And the mass needs to be, it, it cannot be the mass that you can see in the galaxies. In order to bend the light, the mass has to be in the form of apparently something else. And that something else is apparently dark matter. It's dark matter because we can't see it. So, I mean, that's a reasonable name for this. It's dark matter. You know, we don't know what it is, but you can't see it. By the way, um, there is a, an experiment ongoing to I try to identify the dark matter. And uh, there, the, this is happening at Berkeley. Uh, Bernard Sadelet is trying, he's been trying to find the dark matter for 20 years, 15 years, and uh, he hasn't found it yet, but he's looking uh, with particle techniques, and I'll, we'll talk about that. Now, the question is, what is the dark matter? Here's our galaxy, and to recall that the rotation curve of the galaxy uh, went up and stayed flat, it didn't go down to zero. These rotation curves were a tremendous mystery when they were first seen, but uh, the uh, atomic clock, most of the galaxy is stars down in the center of the galaxy. Uh, and there are two possibilities for why the rotation curve uh, climbs and then stays up, it doesn't go down. Two possibilities only. And the possibilities are uh, that we don't understand gravity on this scale. We've made a mistake. Kepler is wrong. Uh, Newton, Newtonian mechanics does not work on this scale. Or uh, the hydrogen velocities we measure is by the gravitational attraction of this stuff, dark matter. And the scientists universally, almost universally, uh, think it's, it's uh, number two. That is what explains it. Uh, so uh, if we trust the theory of gravity, there's a lot of dark matter, 10 times more. Uh, the galaxies, the luminous matter is confined to a disk. The dark matter is not confined to a disk. It's in a spheroid sphere around the galaxy. Uh, it's found in a halo and far be beyond the luminous disk. Uh, this, can, this is understood. Scientists understand why the, the baryonic, the ordinary matter, is more centrally condensed. Uh, it has to do with the fact that the ordinary matter can have, suffer collisions. The collisions heat up the gas, and the gas radiates the energy away, and then it sinks. It sinks, and the dark matter can't do that. It, there's no way it, for it to uh, sink because it cannot suffer these collisions. Okay, um, now let's do this again. Um, come on. Uh, okay, uh, we did this experiment already. Let's remind you. Uh, if we're going to measure the rotation curve along a point, points along this galaxy, which is possible to do. It's easy to do this now with modern instruments. Uh, so you first get a, a red shift, a blue shift here. If you go away from the nucleus, uh, you get 
uh, get a redshift over here, uh, over here, over here, over here. Now we're going outside the, the, the galaxy you can see, but it is possible to measure it in terms of gas, which is uh, associated with the galaxy. Rotation. And if you go on this side of it, uh, you see... Um, All right, so the rotation curve All right, the rotation curve uh, comes up and then down and up. All right, now, if you look at these rotation curves, uh, Okay, so you construct the rotation curve and you see a figure like that all the time. Okay, uh, the rotation curve of a bunch of galaxies, just any bunch of grabbed at random, uh, looks like this. Now this is, a, this is one rotation curve, it's not, it's not two of them. I folded it about the center and the rotation shows it climbs and goes like this. And it, as a function of distance from the center, in thousands of light years, it does that. And we expected the dark matter, if it were no dark matter, the galaxy would have done this. But it doesn't. It stays high. Okay. Uh, they are flat to large distances, and it tells us that the dark matter, if we want to interpret it that way, is distributed outside the disk. Uh, you can measure uh, dark matter in elliptical galaxies. Let me skip that. But uh, ellipticals also show uh, this uh, dark matter. All right, so uh, the mass of a galaxy, just for convenience, it's possible we talk about something called mass to light ratio. And it's measured in solar units. Mass of the sun divided by luminosity of the sun you express it in solar units, and this uh, takes mass to light row. The sun is one, by definition. All right, but uh, within the orbit of the sun, the mass to light ratio for the galaxy is six. Now, it's six because uh, the galaxy is not dominated by stars just like the sun. It's dominated by faint stars. The faint stars have a lot of mass, they don't have much light. And uh, that is consistent with the dark matter being dominated by not. That is consistent with the starlight. All right? So uh, inner regions, uh, you see in elliptical galaxies, you see someone higher value. Uh, you get a value of 10. All right? Uh, but if you include the outer uh, regions, the entire galaxy might be 50. Dwarf galaxies can be higher. Uh, and most of the matter is not stars. And this tells you if it's 50 and you compare it to 6, it tells you that the object is about nine times more massive than indicated by the starlight. All right. So that is very strange, but that is real on every object. What's the dark matter made of? Fundamental question. What is it made of? Okay, now, what could it be made of? It could be made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, the ingredients of ordinary matter. Is that a possibility for the dark matter? All right. Uh, why is it not visible? Uh, if it's ordinary, uh, it might be out of the same stuff we're made of, but then we, uh, it doesn't shine. Why doesn't it shine? It's uh, dim, incredibly dim. All right, if, uh, if, you don't, if we've not discovered it yet, which is the case, if the dark matter is some form that we don't really know, we, don't, we call it extraordinary dark matter, extraordinary matter. So we don't know what it is, just give it a name, extraordinary. That's the name of it. 
Okay, what is this stuff? Uh, and what will, physicists, we call the ordinary matter, neutrons, protons, and electrons, is called uh, baryonic matter. Neutrons and protons are baryons. Uh, it's a term uh, used in particle physics. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the way to say it is uh, the ordinary, the extraordinary matter is non-baryonic. One way you know it's non-baryonic is that the bullet cluster indicates that the dark matter collided, or did not collide it with itself, it just went through it. If that were made of, of uh, matter of uh, neutrons and protons, it would have collided and you see nothing like, you never see the bullet cluster or other things. We're pretty sure that the dark matter is not, uh, not made of uh, baryonic matter. Okay, so uh, what is this stuff? All right, uh, we studied uh, one bar non-baryonic form of this stuff, and the form it took was neutrinos. Neutrinos detected coming from the sun. We know neutrinos exist. Can neutrinos be the dark matter? And the answer is no. Uh, they interact with ordinary matter through two processes. They interact by gravity, and they interact by weak force. Remember, weak force, strong force, electromagnetic, and gravity are the four forces. The weak force is specialized to neutrinos. The weak force is something that protons and neutrons also, uh, they also uh, uh, suffer it, but it's very, very weak. Weak enough that uh, the particles don't really collide under the weak force. So we say that they are weakly interacting. The neutrino is weakly interacting for that reason. Uh, and their masses are low, speeds so high, they'll escape gravitational pull of a galaxy. They can't be the dark matter. Now, long time ago, uh, we did simulations of this, and uh, our simulations said uh, dark matter cannot be neutrinos. This was 30 years ago we published this. Uh, this is what we thought might be the dark matter. Uh, the Russian school uh, thought it was the dark matter, but they gave up on that. Uh, this is the first candidate to be the dark matter, and it was wrong. Uh, all right, so uh, what we want is a massive weakly interacting particle, weak in that it doesn't suffer collisions that you can see. All right, it doesn't, uh, never shines uh, luminous light. Uh, and this weakly interacting particle is known as a weakly interacting massive particle, or WIMP. That is the, that is the dark matter candidate, WIMPs. So if it, say that's a WIMPy particle, uh, but it is the weakly interacting massive particle. Or that is the name of it. Uh, it's pretty silly. Uh, all right, the particles are theoretical. They've not yet been discovered. There's plenty of reason theoretically to believe they're there. But uh, uh, they, and the idea is they'd be massive enough to exert gravitational influence. They're much more massive than a neutrino. And if they're weakly interacting, they don't emit light. If there's no light, you won't, it's pretty hard to see it. Uh, they have no, no charged particles, no charged matter in the whole business. Okay, and uh, weakly interactive particles would not collapse with a galaxy's disk, and they are a natural candidate to be the dark matter around a halo. Uh, so that's why we think they're, dark, they're, uh, uh, they're uh, weakly interacting. Okay, so they're gravitationally bound to the, to the halo of the galaxy, and uh, now, We've been talking about the galaxy formation. Galaxies form by the gravitational attraction of uh, little points. And the points had high gravity, attracted each other, and uh, made, uh, made galaxy. You can ask the same question. What about the, the matter distributed on larger scales, which is so inhomogeneous? 
that matter should attract other matter, and that should give rise to something you can see. And here is a simulation that this is something I did. Uh, this shows the, this is about uh, 50 megaparsecs across there. Uh, it's much bigger than a galaxy, measured in one megaparsec scale. This shows the velocity of these, just a rough guide of the velocity of dark matter that's flowing to, to this wall and flowing to a high density region. These, uh, this is something you can measure locally, and this is work I've done. Um, you can read about it, but look up my papers, but I don't really recommend that. Uh, all right, this, this uh, gravitational attraction has overcome the Hubble expansion, if they're on close scales. Otherwise, it hasn't yet. Uh, and uh, it exerts, it's, it has something known as a peculiar velocity. Uh, and uh, that's what's drawn here. The peculiar velocity is a velocity that differs from the Hubble flow. We see a galaxy at a velocity. We don't really know that the velocity is purely Hubble flow. It could be, it could be Hubble flow plus a peculiar velocity uh, generated by the attraction of everything. Our, our velocity, relative to a frame, I'll tell you later, is 600 kilometers a second. How did that get generated? 600 kilometers a second is, uh, has to be explained by something. And that is explained by peculiar velocities, something of this sort that we'll, maybe we'll talk about later in the course. Now, this can be measured out to considerable distance. It's done. Uh, I'm going uh, at the end of the course. Uh, when we have a final exam, I'll be on my way to Israel uh, for two weeks. Uh, the GSIs will take care of the exam. And uh, there's going to be a conference talking about this sort of motions. Uh, about which I, I have a speech, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, so uh, the structure, everything in the universe shows the, shows the initial structure of the universe. If the universe is dead smooth everywhere, then there's no, no way, there's nothing to attract other matter. It'll expand, 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 and nothing attracts it, and it just stays there. The universe had fluctuations in this beginning. Why it had fluctuations, we'll discuss later. But these fluctuations were responsible for the growth of all the structure on small scales. It made the galaxies, the clusters of galaxies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is an important uh, diagnostic of the universe. It's really quite incredible this is all doable. So uh, it is these over densities uh, turn out to form all the structure we see. They've been growing since the universe was very small. And we'll talk about uh, how they got there and what they mean. It is bizarre. OK. Uh, and all these collapses uh, don't work unless there's a lot of mass associated with them. And that mass is all associated with the dark matter. OK, uh, the, now there's something we call the critical density. Uh, how strong must gravity be to stop the entire universe from expanding? The universe expands, expands, expands. And meanwhile, the, gra the, galaxy, or the mass in one part is slowing it down is attracting itself to each other. And eventually it attracts, and then it turns around. It could, can expand, 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 and then collapses, and then collapses down to a point. All right, so if it, we don't really know what's going to happen. And how can you study this? All right, we talked to the, this is called uh, the critical density. If the mass of the universe, if the density of the universe is low, then it, it doesn't have any trouble expanding forever. If the mass density is high, it will, it will turn around and collapse. 
and we say if the mass has exactly the critical density, it expands, 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 slowing down, but never really turns around. That is a critical universe. Now, we thought the universe is critical. That was a thought uh, 20 years ago. Everybody thought the universe is critical because that's the simplest universe to describe, among other reasons. We thought it was critical, but it's not. It is crazy. Now, uh, the value of H0 tells us the kinetic energy. Uh, the critical density is 10 to the minus 29th gram per cubic centimeter. Uh, now, grams per cubic centimeter. What's the mass of an atom? One atom, say of hydrogen? Anybody know? Uh, Avogadro's number? All right, the mass of a hydrogen atom is uh, two or something times 10 to the minus 24th grams. So that would mean if you have one hydrogen atom, one hydrogen atom distributed in uh, uh, 10 to the fifth, uh, a volume of 10 to the fifth centimeters cubed, that's enough to close the universe. Now that's not very high density, right? That's a hell of a vacuum, a perfect vacuum. You can't get anywhere near that in a vacuum system we, we build on Earth. Yet, it is enough to stop the universe and turn it around and uh, eventually collapse it. So I'm not talking about ordinary times. This is really exotic. Uh, all right. Now, in terms of mass to light ratio, uh, the average mass to light ratio has to be 1,000 times the mass to light of the sun. And we don't see any systems that have 1,000. The most we see is a few hundred. We don't have enough critical, we don't have enough mass. Apparently, we do not have enough mass to make the critical density. And it, it suggests the universe is going to expand forever. 13.3 or whatever uh, billion years old, but it's going to keep going. Someday it'll be 100 billion years old. You'll have long beards, you know. Old, old, old. All right, so that, that is crazy. Now, is that right? Okay, uh, but there's something else. This is, this is a mind-blowing experiment discovered just 12 years ago, 1988, 1998. Okay, what they, just, what they saw is the following. Uh, the critical universe is the blue line, uh, like this. Here is now, and this would be the future. If we have enough matter to uh, overcompensate, the universe starts off at a beginning, goes up, and then collapses. And that's a, that is thought of, you can think of that as the trajectory of a balloon. It starts off at a point, it expands, and then collapses. And that is, that is what happened. But that doesn't fit the data. If the universe uh, is uh, let's see. Critical, okay, yeah. All right, I'm sorry. The critical density is not the blue one. It's this one, the, yellow, the gr uh, greenish one. What is that? Yellow. All right, That's, that has just enough matter for the universe to expand and then stop. And that doesn't fit the data very well either, particularly high, high redshift. Now this is looking back in the past, looking back four billion, eight billion years. You look back eight billion years, the time travel is large enough, and you look at it. Now here's, here's one here, coasting. This one has, uh, it's basically a universe with nothing in it. It just, flows away. Okay, and that doesn't fit the data either. Coasting. A universe with nothing in it is not sufficient to fit the data. Instead, the universe is accelerating. In other words, 
If I throw a ball up in the air, it doesn't fall back. It takes off. I just threw it, and now bang, takes off. That's what the universe is doing. What the hell kind of universe is that? All right, that is discovered in the last 12 years. We had, we thought it was, it was doing that before. There's lots of evidence that it was. But this is direct observations of, uh, of these objects. And this is worthy of Nobel Prize, and they won a Nobel Prize this year. Uh, Saul Perlmutter and uh, Adam Rees and uh, uh, oh God, a guy from Australia. Anyhow, these, were, these guys were head of big teams. It's not really fair to give it only to them. But they decided they can only give a Nobel Prize among three. Uh, they can't give it among 20. Uh, so uh, 20 people really worked on it, and this is the result. The universe is accelerating, and that is so bizarre. If you put matter in the universe, ordinary matter, it doesn't accelerate. There's no way to make ordinary matter accelerate. And baryonic matter, or dark matter, doesn't make the universe accelerate. It's crazy. And so you want to understand how you can get such an insane, uh, how it can act in such an insane way. This was done with these white dwarf supernova that we were talking about earlier. The white dwarf supernova are the great ways to see this. Uh, OK, they're a great standard candle. And they're fainter than predicted, and they are, they, uh, are interpreted as being uh, accelerating away from us. OK, uh, the galaxies should be closer. Uh, supernova are further back in time. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is the most bizarre type of uh, result. OK, the universe is accelerating, and there is an unknown force that is known not as dark matter, Very, be careful here now, it's known as dark energy. It's not dark matter. It's completely different than dark matter. And distinct, the distinction is important. And we'll talk about what the, how you get dark energy. Believe me, you don't get it in a laboratory. OK. Uh, all right. Let me show you a couple of uh oh, come on. Here it is. Okay. All right, now. Let's look at this universe. Uh, we're going to play with the universe, and we're going to play with its uh, density. So first, let's, uh, let's make the density low. Uh, OK. Uh, say 0 0.5. Uh, oh, I see. I do it this way. Uh, OK. All right, so density is low. All right, and as, here is the co-moving grid. And start the universe. Now here is a drawing that shows what the universe is doing. And it's basically expanding, expanding, expanding. And uh, it uh, expands forever. And that doesn't turn around. That's a low density. All right, let's raise the density. All right. It's curving, 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 curving. And it looks like it has enough matter to make the universe turn around. All right. So if we make the matter, if we, if we make the mass higher, uh, then do it again. Uh, oh, it doesn't get very far until it collapses. Okay. 
So the universe uh, will not get far if the density is too high. If the density is too low, the universe escapes. It escapes itself. All right, so this is the role of the density parameter that you play with, uh, just like this. This is a nice way to see what the universe is doing. Yeah? So if it does collapse into itself, is that just kind of like a cycle where it collapses the Big Bang and goes again into the Big Bang? Oh, maybe. It could. Yeah, that's an idea. That certainly was an idea that was uh, relevant. I mean, that was a conversation of uh, what happened. Uh, people had no idea what was what. But we don't think that was, that's the answer now. Okay, the later, the new data is a very, very different. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Okay, now, we have two, di there's two dials now. There's the dark matter, and there is the dark energy. Strength of dark energy, okay? The strength of dark matter. So let me tune this down. Okay, let's try this, and have no dark, dark energy. And the universe just uh, expands, all right? Um, let's tune it up. Tune it up, say, to a high value. Well, this universe really wants to expand. Right, the universe, this one apparently is just, just massive enough to turn around. Okay? Now, let's say, let's put some dark energy into it as well. Uh, we'll put in some dark energy. The universe doesn't really respond for a while, but oops, it's taking off. The universe is going, accelerating now. Acceleration is when the curve turns up. You all, you all took calculus enough to know the difference, right? Deceleration is when it turns down. But acceleration is what the universe does. Note how convenient it is to plot everything in terms of this parameter, this parameter that measures the size of the balloon. We're going to use this again. So everything is, is cast in terms of the radius of the, of the balloon that we're living on. Okay, so now let's... Uh, Let's put it, uh, get it up, up a ways. All right, and begin. And it, the dark matter turns it down, and whoops, the dark, it inflects once. Uh, here it's decelerating, here it's accelerating. The universe started off decelerating, but later the dark energy caused it to accelerate. Now what is happening is a dark energy is something called a vacuum energy. We'll talk about how that works. And the vacuum energy does not dilute as the universe expands. So you start off with the universe of a size, and it has a lot of matter in it. It's a dense, dense matter. It has a lot of gravity. But the universe expands, the matter dilutes. But the dark energy does not dilute. Craziest thing, the dark energy is the same. How can that be? If I just expanded the balloon and dark energy expanded? All right. Now, the trouble is I can't use math for this course. In mathematics, uh, it's very simple to explain this. Uh, that's God's language. But we uh, have to use old-fashioned English. And that uh, makes it hard to understand. All right, so uh, the universe manages to expand in this case. Uh, all right, so that is really, really bizarre. OK, now uh, let, me, uh, let me just finish the slides. OK, 
Okay, the idea is uh, we have four universes to choose from. We have a recollect, the universe started as a Big Bang down somewhere. And uh, the present is right here. The future is this way. The past is down here. Uh, the universe started, uh, for it could have been a recollapsing universe, first one. It started and uh, expanded, expanded, then collapsed. That was one idea. The next idea was a critical universe. It expands, 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 and it, it slows down as it expands and eventually slows down. But if you, if, the lower, if you lower the density a little bit, it'll go into a coasting universe where the, uh, the mass has escaped itself, the velocity is higher than the mass can retard, and it eventually just flies away. Meanwhile, an accelerating universe uh, has, it, it uh, grows and right away, I mean, in the future, it's going to expand faster. It's not going to slow down. It's going to be very, very fast. Okay? That is what apparently our universe will do. And that's uh, different from any of these other universes. Unfortunately, we cannot, in such a universe, you don't get a chance to repeat it. You have one shot. Okay, and, that's, and apparently the one shot is led to the accelerating universe. So that's new data. Nobody th was thinking of that, but that's, what it, that's the way it goes. Uh, the critical density won't collapse, expand slowly. Uh, coasting universe. And, and the accelerating universe, ex it accelerates, and that's the model that currently is favored. All these models are consistent with Einstein's theory of general relativity, all of them. Einstein's theory does not pick out our universe. It just has a mathematical framework to allow the description of any universe. It's very easy, actually, to play with Einstein's equations and to turn them and to show what these different universes do. It's no problem. If uh, you would take this, if you are a student in the astrophysics department, you would, uh, you would study how this works by the time you're a senior. Okay, it's not a difficulty. Okay, so uh, now here I want to show you this. This is a super simulation run at uh, Max Planck. Uh, with by Simon White. He used to be here. This is why I came to Berkeley. He was here. And this simulation shows us going into it. Uh, 250 megaparsecs. It's a gigantic job. This is a huge job. It used every computer in a super cluster. In, this is in Munich. Uh, this, is a, this is showing a rich cluster of galaxies in the simulation. Filaments and voids all over the place. An amazing picture. Oh God, we're out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, I will show you the, the remaining movie uh, next time. Okay, uh, all right, that's how our universe is made. Uh, that is my, the work I have done. I, have, I didn't do all this work, but uh, that's my field is uh, in this field. And uh, it's been an incredibly exciting time to be in it. All this is new. None of this was known when I started this school. In fact, I started large scale structure. Nobody before me had the patience to look at these galaxies one at a time. So uh, all this has prog incredible progress, incredible. Okay.